Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome him tonight to this prestige lecture. Um, Tensha is proud to present this uh, prestige lecture by one of our extraordinary professors, Professor Robbie Gilligan. And we really look forward to the lecture tonight and also to learn uh, from him, not only tonight but also in the future. Um, before we start with our program, I would really like just to welcome a few people. And firstly, Professor Gilligan, uh, Gilligan himself, and then also his wife Mary, who is here with him tonight. We are glad that she can also join us tonight um, in this celebration. Um, secondly, we would like to uh, welcome our Vice Rector, Professor Linda de Plessis, who has been supporting us um, all the time in Obtentia, and so also our Executive Dean, Professor Tini Tron. And then tonight, Professor Linda Tron is um, also here, and she is the uh, sub-program leader for um, the program in which uh, Professor Gilligan will work, and so also Dr. Anzi Fischer and then Dr. Alvin Wurta was the school director. So welcome to all of you, and also to all our colleagues, um, researchers in Obtentia, uh, and then also the students and partners. Thanks for being here. Now, at Obtentia, our mission is to do research and um, to really develop and organize knowledge. And tonight is another contribution uh, towards that. Um, and that is what, what we keep ourselves busy with, and it's important to us. Um, in terms of our affiliation currently, we have 28 research staff, three uh, support staff, 24 um, of these people have PhDs completed of our staff members, and then we have 11 temporary staff members, notably extraordinary professors. Um, what is also special for us is that we have another person joining us in January, Professor Jakob Hoffman, and then also today we heard that we will appoint Professor Sylvia Koller as well um, as an extraordinary professor um, in Obtentia. She's from Brazil. So we're very glad about that one um, as well. Um, in terms of our publications, just today we heard that another two were accepted for publication. So you can see that currently we are at about 74 publications, not to say that um, all of them will be published this year. Um, we hope for um, quite a good number there. But um, you can see our article equivalence is about at 40. Um, and you can also see that we are um, reaching sort of a stable um, production in terms of our publications. We have about 60 participating master students currently in Ocentia and then 36 PhD students. Now I analyzed that um, numbers a little bit more and what I saw was that about 50% of our master students are students who registered since last year. Um, and then of the 36 uh, PhD students, these students registered, 50% uh, of them registered since 2013, and they also have proposals approved. So uh, you can see that the growth in our masters and PhD came from 2013, largely, 2013 and 2014. Um, to tell you the actual truth is that uh, we have quite a constant stream of good PhD candidates who are currently and we have to stop it at some stage because we can thank so many students. But we also try to, um, to juggle that, that one a little bit. Um, we now know that for this year we have two postdocs and already we know for next year we will have another two postdocs. And what is very interesting is that um, I think three of the four postdocs are people from other African countries. So that is also a good thing that um, we get our postdocs also from um, elsewhere in Africa and we can learn and be involved there as well. 
Um, in terms of our thrusts, we just discussed it uh, a week ago, so it's really important for us to build competence, and that is where we are so glad that we have Professor Gilligan also involved here, because we know that the most important thing for us here is that we should become competent, and it's a, it's a constant process, and we know that the outputs will be there, the quality outputs, but first we have to, um, to become competent. So, and then our international profile is important for us to take hands internationally with people, to learn from the best, and also to share some of the best that we um, develop here in Asia. And then obviously quality masters and PhD outputs, you will see from next year onwards, um, our production and outputs in that regard will be much better than it was up to now. Um, and external internal use of our research, and I think it, it, it will also link to what uh, Professor Gilligan uh, will say tonight, and that is that we do not just do research to do research. We want to make a difference in the world out there in South Africa. Um, so we want to help and solve practical problems. Um, but we also want to do it in a responsible way and also learn from our environment in South Africa and keep our research, uh, in a sense, culturally informed, culturally sensitive, um, and so on. Um, if you look at some of the research projects, you can see what we are actually doing, well being of teachers in secondary schools, I think it's a real challenge uh, in our secondary schools, also in other schools, but, but um, this is the type of topics that we address in our research. Trust within the work context, sexual behavior and psychosocial well-being, psychosocial well-being in marginalized groups, psychological capital, um, and I missed a few others, like social technologies of resilience, Understanding unemployment experiences in South Africa, developing evidence-based interventions there, intervention program for women who have experienced childhood sexual abuse, and so on. And then also, if you look at our community projects, you will see that our people are involved in a range of community projects, and we um, believe that that cycle between teaching and research and um, being involved in, in the community is really important. Um, now, regarding tonight's program, it's a little bit from my side. I think what we first want to do is um, ask Bali and um, Cindy to deliver, deliver um, a musical item, and then I will introduce Professor Gilligan. So, if um, Bali could just come. Um, Thank you very 
Um, just to say that we will now have the after I introduce Professor Gilligan, we will have the prestige lecture, and then um, our function will be at the Ticket Clubhouse, and then our vice rector will just close uh, the ceremony for us. So, um, about Professor Gilligan, he's from Ireland, um, and he's a professor of social work and social policy at Trinity College in Dublin, also associate director of the Children Research Centre. Now, typically, to keep information fresh, I did a uh, Google Scholar search <laughs> just before the uh, ceremony tonight, and I found 98 publications, and um, good publications, on Google Scholar for him, and noted that his uh, top cited article was actually cited 211 times by today. It will change on Tuesdays and on Fridays, I think, and Sunday evenings. It will change again, so uh, if you really want to do But this will be, um, yeah, this article was about adversity, resilience, and young people, the protective value of foster school and spare time um, experiences, and it was uh, in children and society that this article um, was published. So, um, Robbie, uh, we're really glad that you're here tonight with us and we really look forward and we know that we will have a lot of practical value and not just research and theoretical value from your lecture. So, thanks and I would like to invite you to do your lecture. Hello everybody, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed to the Vice Rector Du Plessis and to uh, Professor Rothman for this very kind invitation to deliver this prestige lecture. It's a great honour, it's a great honour to be associated with the important work of Optensia and it's a great honour to be given this opportunity to deliver this lecture, so thank you very much indeed. So the title of my lecture is Global Challenges of Youth and Poverty, A Role for Universities. Half the world's population is under 25 years of age. It takes a, I find that quite hard to believe actually, but this is the case. One in every five people on the planet is aged between 15 and 25. These young people aged 15 to 25 represent 20% of the world's population, but 40% of the world's unemployed. And in fact, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, says that we really are probably undercounting the percentage of youth unemployed because of the way we count the figures. The World Bank reckons that in South Asia, more than one million young people will enter the labor force every month in the next two decades. Let's just say that again. <laughs> the World Bank reckons that in South Asia, more than one million young people will enter the labor force every month in the next two decades. That is quite a stunning figure. Now, notice the terminology, entering the labor force. This, not, this, this does not mean that people have a livelihood, or that they have a job, or they have an income. In developing countries, and also in developed countries, there is a clear pattern of youth unemployment running at over twice the adult rate of unemployment. This is remarkably consistent across Western Europe, parts of Latin America, Asia, Africa, and so on. And the, the pattern is also evident here in South Africa. And in fact, one of the, the uh, challenges of preparing a paper like this is the, the range of different evidence and different statistics that are available 
depending on definitions that are used. But depending on the definition uh, used to count unemployment or to count as unemployment in South Africa, the proportion of young people considered to be unemployed could range between 30% and 60%. Okay, so the, the, these are really major issues facing uh, young people across the globe, not just here in South Africa. The, the focus of my lecture is the global picture, although obviously I am aware that I'm speaking in South Africa and I will uh, use many African uh, references, if you like. The harsh reality seems to be that mechanization, automation, digitization, and all the Asians you can think of each shave off many more jobs from the labor market in all the countries of the world and in effect go on to reduce job opportunities for every new generation of young people. And the trends that we can see point to a steady closing down of opportunities for young people. Even when we leave the, the issue of jobs and livelihoods to one side for a moment, the picture still remains challenging for young people globally. Just to take two examples. Youth amount to one-third of the total population globally living with HIV or AIDS, the 15 to 25 age group. Almost half of the girls, of girls in South Asia in the South Asia region marry before the age of 18, which of course is a proxy measure of poverty since early marriage is very strongly associated with poverty. These figures paint a startling story. But overall, in the blizzard of evidence, the main message is that young people globally are heavily overrepresented among the poorest people. Yet, in, tr in truth, these figures, and many more like them, only tell a tiny part of the whole story. Bare numbers and percentages cannot fill, they can't fill in the human detail. They can't fill in all the hurt and the hope. They can't fill in all of the lived lives behind these statistics. The inescapable reality across the globe is that youth are asked to bear much more than their fair share of the burden of unemployment. And this is even more starkly true in the case of youth living in poverty. Quality education offers some protection, but that is typically not available to poor young people. There is also the stark paradox that never has any generation been promised so much and given so little. I will cheer you up later on. <laughs> but the point I'm making is that in many ways this generation has been promised so much and actually gets so little. Right across the world, the digital and other media reveal the untold opportunities to young people, only for reality to snatch those opportunities away. Youth must bear an unfair burden, knowing in many ways that they have been cheated. Even those who might not travel all the road with me on this would have to concede that what I am saying rings with a lot of truth. So many young people are locked out. They're on the outside looking in. The current picture is gloomy in terms of the prospects of many young people globally, as I'm showing you. And crucially for our purposes this evening, the picture does not like, look like it's getting any better. Since the dynamics that are driving the current picture look like they will continue to drive trends into the future. There is rightly increasing concern 
internationally about climate change and environmental sustainability related to the physical environment. And in this, I proudly acknowledge the leadership of our own Chancellor at Trinity College Dublin, Mary Robinson, who is currently the UN Special Representative on Climate Justice. I certainly support work on sustainability and the physical environment. But I would also say that we must be concerned with social sustainability, with the sustainability of the social fabric of our societies. Preserving the social fabric, I would suggest, requires a minimum level of justice and equity that sustains the mutual commitment of all people in any given society, a mutual commitment to the future cohesion of that society. If we are to take seriously this issue of social fabric, then we must also take seriously the issues facing youth the opportunities they have, and how seriously societies offer these young people a real sense of being part of their own society. Massive social questions like child abuse, youth crime, child hunger, domestic violence, all of these rightly receive major policy attention in different countries, although many of us might say that they don't receive enough policy attention. Yet, in this maze of issues, there is, I suggest, an even greater danger of losing sight of the conditions that often underpin and feed these component issues. These issues betray a strain in the social fabric which is due in very large part to the absence of income, the absence of status in many ways, and the absence of meaning in their lives in many cases for many of the young people we're looking at tonight. Like everyone, young people need to find recognition and purpose in their lives. Recognition and purpose that they have been given the chance to earn for themselves, that they can earn that recognition and that sense of purpose. The challenge for the adult world, for the institutional systems, is to create conditions where pathways and opportunities for recognition and purpose, for that recognition and purpose, that those pathways exist or that the young people can see them. The idea is not that opportunities should be handed to young people on a plate, but certainly we should be looking to ensure that there are realistic possibilities for them and that they can see them. Now, my lecture this evening is about how universities can make, one, make their special contribution and one special contribution to creating these positive conditions. I'm making the case that universities have a special place and a special capacity in this project of creating more favorable conditions for excluded young people. Universities don't bring money, and if they do, I want to know which one it is. <laughs> um, but they bring something even more powerful. They bring ideas. And they bring more than ideas for some new products or some new companies. They bring ideas on how to align, or they can bring ideas on how to align social and economic developments with the real needs of young people, and particularly marginalized young people. Now, clearly there are a range of issues that universities can help to address that are very relevant to creating better conditions. Universities seem well-placed to contribute to the renewal of education and training in many countries. They can contribute new models or renewal of models of education and training with stronger and better quality components of work experience. They can help to develop better models of on-the-job teaching and learning. 
They can help to suggest ways to promote positive public attitudes to young people in poverty and their social needs. Not just to suggest, but to find the evidence base. And both in the university and in the wider community, universities can help to promote a better appreciation of the capacity of young people, not just in a technical sense, but in a human sense. The university sector has capacity to help a range of key actors to respond in a more informed, integrated, and systemic way to the issues I'm raising. Clearly, I would say, universities are not responsible for driving coordination and action. That's, up for, that's the business of other actors, and we must be careful that, we don't, that what I'm saying doesn't suggest some kind of drift in the mission of the universities. But having said that, universities can certainly be a catalyst with others for action, for change, and for research to inform that action and that change. If we think about it, universities have been crucial in promoting the issue of climate change and for informing and driving the debate. Now, it's not that the a co a global coalition of universities issued statements and documents and declarations about climate change, but the university sector internationally has been a very important source of new evidence, of fr fresh ideas, fresh perspectives, fresh debates, because the universities create a space in which scientists can do this important work and can transmit important new evidence and challenging thoughts and ideas. So when I speak about the universities, that is the sense in which I mean the term university, this space, this intellectual space that opens up the possibility of new ways of thinking and new ways of action. So universities have shown their capacity on environmental sustainability they can, I suggest, also do the same on social sustainability. Now, the work of the scientists and the members of universities did not bring instant change on climate issues. But their work did support the process of awareness building over the long haul. These scientists, these researchers, these members of the university community internationally have helped to cultivate positive ideas, positive attitudes, and positive practices in support of the case for climate change. Or if more correctly, the case against climate change, but anyhow. <laughs> in choosing my topic and its timing this evening, I'm aware that the UN system is about to promulgate the successors to the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals. These will guide national and international development efforts in the coming years. There are 13 of these new Sustainable Development Goals, and six of them, I'm pleased to say, relate strongly to the focus of this lecture, in other words, to themes of youth development and poverty. And others of the 13 are relevant in some way. So that awareness kind of informed my choice of topic for this evening's lecture. But I was also conscious of its location, and I thought that it was a relevant theme in, to speak of in South Africa because, because it relates, I think, to experiences and issues in South Africa domestically, but also internationally in terms of South Africa's role internationally. As you know, South Africa has a major leadership role in developments on the world stage through its status as a major force in Africa, as a member of G20, as one of the BRICS economies, and through exciting developments such as the new BRICS Global Bank. 
I think this university and this country is an appropriate setting also because of the work here of Optensia, the work here in N Northwest University, which is led by Professor Rothman, as, and he gave us some sense of that work in his opening remarks. I also want to recognize and acknowledge the work being done here in Optensia by International Youth Resilience Scholar, Professor Linda Theron. She and her colleagues in the International Resilience Network have done very important work globally in highlighting the strengths and capacities of young people living in challenging conditions. In addressing this issue of youth and poverty, I seek to highlight the importance and enormity of the challenge of finding solutions globally for youth in poverty. I wish also to stress that this challenge can be engaged with. It is not a hopeless challenge. The stakes are high, but so also are the possibilities. There is the technical challenge of finding the right approaches, but there is also the challenge of hope, of believing in the importance and the feasibility of the project. There has to be first a climate of belief. As the head of the World Bank, Jim Kim, said recently, Optimism is a moral choice. Optimism is a moral choice. In many ways, I see the primary purpose of my presentation as being to help foster that climate of belief. We have to believe in facing up to the challenge and in the importance of marshalling key institutions in engaging with the challenge. I am pointing out that universities are among the key institutions in every society and that they have a great deal to offer. The special status and role of universities means they have a special obligation, I would suggest, and a special capacity to respond to the challenges globally of youth poverty, youth unemployment, and youth exclusion. If enough energy, capacity, and commitment is brought to bear on these challenges, then real progress can be made. Universities can become a major lever in ensuring that the necessary energy, capacity, and commitment is forthcoming. So in some ways, my most important message to you this evening is the need for conviction, for all of us to have a conviction, all of us in the university community, in the university sector globally, to have a conviction that the challenge of youth exclusion must be taken up and can be taken up. As we approach the topics of poverty and youth, even the terms we use have to be subject to scrutiny. Youth may mean different things in different contexts. It may be classified differently in different countries, in different systems. And poverty, of course, may be defined in a whole range of ways. There is a ver veritable industry of social, within social science debating the meanings and definitions of poverty. And of course, the term poverty may mean one thing to people in government or people in university offices and quite another to people on the ground living in difficulty. I don't need to remind this audience that poverty is about the lack of money, but of course, it's about a lot of other things as well. Fundamentally, poverty is about a lack of inclusion in the mainstream opportunities of society, the mainstream institutions. It's about a lack of participation, it's about a lack of recognition, the invisibility of poor people. Tackling poverty issues as they impact on youth clearly needs a concerted macro-level approach on economic and social policy fronts. But it needs more than a top-down response. I want to argue from my social work perspective that tackling poverty issues affecting youth also needs to be informed in a seriously grounded way to be informed by the lived experience of young people who live on the margins in different ways. I'm stressing that we need to pay very close attention and help others to pay very close attention to the lived experience of young people themselves, especially the experience of those living in or close 
to the different realities of poverty. This will keep us honest and reduce the chances of our straying into the realms of denial or delusion as we debate and develop policies. It's very easy for people to pontificate about poor, the poor and poverty from a long distance away in the offices and meeting rooms of various institutions. Much harder to do that when you actually have the voice of the people experiencing poverty really being heard. Ensuring that we listen to the lived experience will mean that there is a better chance that our policies recognize and respond to the real issues and real experiences on the ground. It is important to pay attention to the views at the grassroots, at the grassroots in fact, that will be one of my main points this evening, the importance globally of finding meaningful ways of, gauging, of engaging young people and their ideas and talents in the search for solutions to poverty. And especially in the search for solutions to, to poverty as it impacts on young people themselves. I'd suggest there are three critical issues in tackling Poverty among young people may seem reasonably obvious, not too contentious, but nevertheless. First is good quality educational opportunities, which of course we know, we know this in principle, very, very difficult to see it delivered in practice. The second issue is ensuring that far greater numbers of young people have both meaningful and rewarding livelihoods and occupations. Again, a daunting challenge as I sketch for you at the beginning. The third issue is ensuring that many more young people across the globe have meaningful opportunities to be involved, to contribute to building institutions and societies and communities that serve people of all ages, serve all people of all ages. If, if we are to rise to these challenges, then we must respond on a scale that faces up to the many issues. We must face up to the sheer numbers of young people involved. We must face up to the fact that so many young people are poorly served by education systems. We must face up to the fact that poverty is not randomly distributed. And, partic and in particular, many minorities around the world have a very unfair burden of poverty, uh, and minorities involving young people. Young people from ethnic minorities, young people with disabilities, young migrants and refugees, young people from the very poorest communities. All of these young people bear a very high risk of living in poverty. The implications of this, very wide ranging, take one example, the Roma population, a very highly stigmatized minority within Europe, Half of Roma children do not complete primary school. Half of Roma children do not co complete primary school. Imagine the, we don't need to dwell long on the implications of that for their employment prospects, their future educational prospects, their, their future social opportunities. We have to concede that there are some initiatives which are beginning to try to address deep poverty across the globe, and the World Bank is beginning to take a responsibility in that area. But the question is whether these initiatives really pay enough attention to the impact of poverty on poor young people. While youth in poverty is the focus here tonight, it is also important to highlight that in general, young people overall from all social backgrounds, I would suggest do not get their proportionate share of policy priority. So what I'm saying is that institutions across the world tend not to give sufficient attention to the youth perspective in their decision making and in their governance. And in some ways, an important part of improving matters for the large number of young people on the margins is to ch challenge societies and institutions to improve things for all young people. This may, just that single step might actually have quite an impact on the state and prospects of marginalized young people. 
Failure to engage fully with the issues of marginalised young people has many implications for each society and for each local community. To, to allow young people to be excluded from work and participation is not just a loss for each young person, it has implications for the society, the community, the collectivities they belong to. Having their talent wasted is also a loss and a threat for wider development. Youth poverty, youth unemployment, youth exclusion also lead so easily to youth disaffection. Such youth disaffection is linked inevitably to challenges such as violence in households or the community, major rural to urban migration, a constant thread everywhere around the world as people follow the paths to the bright lights of the city and the mistaken belief that there's a pot of gold at the end of the route in the city. But there's also trafficking, crime, conflict and war. Now, in saying that these have some link with youth exclusion and youth poverty, I'm not saying that, that those represent some excuse for these crimes and these problems. But neither should we ignore their context. They do have a bearing on the emergence of these issues, poverty and exclusion. Achieving national development is not just about tapping into the talents of elite groups. It is also about harnessing and releasing the talent and energy of all young people. National development in each country must mean more young people having more opportunities. In developing an effective response, we need to learn from youth experience and also from projects that reflect and engage with that youth experience. And if one searches, one can find examples, sometimes inspiring, and sometimes examples of youth-led projects which are trying to create economic opportunities for young people or social supports for young people. There's the example of the Cliptown Youth Project in Cliptown in Soweto, which was founded, I understand, by a 16-year-old uh, and has proved sustainable with the support of different uh, groups from outside. But in other parts of Africa also, there are examples of projects being supported from the World Bank, but also sometimes internally within countries uh, to try and create economic opportunities, job creation opportunities, income, livelihoods for, for young people, sometimes with the support of the World Bank, uh, sometimes with the support of international NGOs. Uh, I think we can find examples of those kind of projects in most African countries, but of course the problem is these are very limited in their reach or their spread. But they do represent, I think, examples of one of the ways that we have to move. It is also worth reminding ourselves that good educational experience, which of course really has to be at the heart of change, Good educational experience brings many rewards beyond, beyond educational attainment. It brings rewards in terms of employment chances and in terms of health, but also in protection against violence and early marriage for girls. And also, I would suggest, also eventually in the prospects for the children of those girls. The girls who stay longer in education will transmit a commitment about education to the next generation. We need person-centered tracking to learn more about the dynamics of how entry into an exclusion from the labor market actually plays out in practice in the lives of individual young people and in their communities. We should also remember that there is much value in studying the informal sector. While street traders and waste pickers are often among the poorest people, it is also true that there is a great deal to be learned from the logic behind their choices and practices. We can learn a lot from young street traders and other basic level entrepreneurs. They display skills, know-how and pride that is very precious in the wider development of livelihood opportunities. There's much to be learned from the resilience of such grassroots entrepreneurs, from this and other examples of the informal sector. And of course, one of the reasons we know about some of this 
is because of the research that has been done by university scientists and social scientists across the world. And of course, one of the things that the researchers have drawn our attention to is the danger of regulation of urban planners and council, local government in different countries actually closing down the legal space for street traders and waste pickers and so on, when in fact these actually represent very important economic opportunities for people who have very few economic opportunities. Unfortunately, there aren't many quick fixes in this game of trying to find new economic opportunities for what essentially are lower skill occupations for young people. The, tr the problem in, a, in many ways is that the sh there is a shrinkage in the number of low skill occupation opportunities globally. Now we might hope that some sectors like tourism would offer some hope in that direction. But we know from work in, in various places and probably from our own instincts uh, that this is not a simple matter. A study in Sapa in northwest Vietnam has found, for example, that in order to prosper in tourism, the, uh, the, the rather obvious point that the local people have to speak an international language. And of course, having a language skill like that is almost you know, rules out people who, who, from a poor background or with poor educational experience. Also, many people in tourism in that region in Vietnam really had to have some money, some capital behind them to initiate their tourism project. Now, that, it doesn't completely rule out tourism as a potential source of work, obviously, but it does, I think, su suggest a note of caution. There are hopefully, opportunities in areas like agriculture, horticulture, community-based rehabilitation, climate change prevention, or climate change protection, perhaps. Also, better opportunities for people with higher literacy skills, obviously. Uh, basic skills such as combination of literacy and driving opens up job opportunities that might not otherwise exist for some young people. Personal care work, sports coaching, mobile phone support services, all of these offer perhaps some hope for creating lower skill occupational opportunities for young people, but they don't, I don't think they're going to close the gap between where we stand and where we need to be. In part, developing opportunities for young people is linked to developments in the economy, but it is also linked to the priorities accorded young people in the given society or the given political system. Looking at the broader picture beyond employment, it is important to find meaningful ways of including youth in all facets of the work of organizations. This requires a mindset shift by the adults in power. It means seeing young people as stakeholders with a legitimate interest, with a voice that should be heard, with views that can be learned from. They are stakeholders because they are affected by the decisions of the organizations and institutions around which they live. And as stakeholders, they are entitled to be heard, entitled to have influence. One important step in this direction may be a trend developing in some countries of lowering the voting age to 16 years. However, I think there's a risk that that is potentially a cosmetic exercise. And unless there is deeper change, I, I would think that that will not make a great deal of difference. I, I recall from my childhood a phrase in my Catholic upbringing that when a Catholic child or adult confesses their sins and looks for forgiveness, for forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is dependent on a firm purpose of amendment. In other words, you must make a serious commitment to change. And of course, I think the question for me is, do, do the governments that are introducing cosmetic changes, like reducing the age of voting to 16, do they actually have a firm purpose of amendment? Do the institutions 
that talk about change, do they have a firm purpose of amendment? Or are we think, looking at something that in fact is skin deep? If we are to see change, we need to see it happen at different levels. We need to see youth issues high up the agenda of the World Bank and other key global players. We, we need to see it high up the agenda of national government and of local government. We need to see a whole new level of engagement with youth issues. At community and neighborhood level, there also needs to be a renewal. Renewed educational leadership which engages in a new way with young people as individuals and as groups. And I would also say that uh, the work that's being done in NWU here in training social workers, I think, is extending the capacity of uh, services and communities to reach out to young people and engage with them in meaningful ways. And I was very impressed by the presentations by students yesterday at the Intercampus Day, where many of them were giving examples of how they had run projects, which tried in a small way to give more voice to young people. And it's very important that we actually equip people at ground level with the skills to do this kind of work. So a critical issue in policy implementation is moving from the headlines to the practical steps necessary. We all cheer the idea We all cheer the idea of improving education systems, but does our concentration span extend, for example, to the detail of how to do that? How to better train and support teachers? As in all endeavor, progress will begin one step at a time. Key steps include the pivotal issue ensuring the quality of basic education. This in turn is linked to the quality of teacher recruitment, training and support. While avoiding any dumbing down, there would also seem to be a need for a dialogue in many countries as to what core functional skills education and schools should seek to impart. Clearly, literacy is central and not to be taken for granted. It's very depressing how many school systems in the developed world seem to manage to produce children who are not literate at the end of a cycle of, of education. But in addition to literacy, ICT skills, and possibly driving skills. We also need to explore ways of bridging the rigid divide that typically splits school and work experience. We need to work harder at bringing work experience into the school life and educational experience into work life. We also re need to recognize that there may be social and physical barriers preventing the achievement of educational goals. Goals typically set at international conferences and, and events. Always worthy events, of course. But the goal of widening participation in secondary ed education may be impeded by many practical things, like the shortage of secondary schools and the distance schools are from the communities where children actually live. This point has come to my attention, particularly through the work of a PhD student of mine, who is researching the uh, challenges, the social challenges facing young women who choose to leave their families and communities at the age of 12 to move to cities in order to attend secondary school. And the social challenges and cultural challenges involved for them in doing that. It's, and I'm sure that's a story that's familiar to people in other countries as well. So we have to get down to that kind of humble reality if we want to implement the rhetoric of global promises. In all of this, is the university to be a neutral onlooker or is the university to be an engaged stakeholder into this great, in the face of this great challenge of youth and poverty? In my view, the university cannot be neutral. The, the role of universities is to bring hope, to inspire hope, to inspire hope through the values, the ideas, and the knowledge they represent. Universities must serve the public good. Universities must have an important role in creating a positive climate 
for social and economic development. Within our focus this evening, universities contribute to, can contribute to sustaining a supportive ecology, a phrase that sh showed up on Professor Rathman's slides earlier, in sustaining a supportive ecology for young people affected by poverty. Universities are essentially youth serving Sorry, yes, universities are essentially youth serving and hopefully therefore youth oriented institutions. They are meant to be powerhouses in the generation and transmission of fresh ideas. They are hubs for the promotion of education. And I think that's a point I will stress strongly in a number of ways. It's important the importance of the idea of the university as a hub for the promotion of education generally. So universities must surely be allies and intellectual activists in the search for youth-friendly responses to the challenges of youth poverty, youth unemployment, and youth exclusion. A key element of such youth-friendly responses has to be promoting education for underserved young people. And there's certainly room for that improvement in every context, in every country, rich or poor, around the world. Okay, just reminding myself how to work these things. I think this is called grace under pressure. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Okay, <laughs> we had we had a we had a plan B, a plan B underway, but. <laughs> It is easier to read off the page. <laughs> okay, so there seem to be three key ingredients in tackling poverty and un unemployment for young people. Education, a supportive economic and social climate, and of course the initiative of young people themselves. And I think that universities can help to cultivate each of these, to cultivate the educational opportunities, to cultivate the social and economic climate ne necessary and to cultivate the initiative of young people. It is appropriate, surely, for universities to be very active in seeking to improve educational opportunities for underserved young people, as I've said. Universities can help to respond to the new educational realities. For most people now, even in the educational elites, the people who do very well in the current system, education is no longer a neat linear progression to the end of study at 18 or 22, followed by a job. This model might have been relevant in certain places at one point, but it is increasingly less relevant. We now know that educational and work pathways are increasingly likely to be intertwined over a lifetime. And our, our, our mindsets and our practices, sorry. <laughs> need to adjust accordingly. <laughs> we need to adjust as individuals, and crucially, institutions such as universities also need to adjust at their level. And I think that universities need to provide leadership and support to, other, to others in achieving such change. Universities can play an important part in building the capacity of the overall education system, the idea of the university as education hub. I can, however, hear the vice rector and the managers and leaders of different universities around the world saying, this is all very worthy, but where do we get the money to do this? Well, in part, yes, that is an issue. And I think there is a case to be negotiated with different funders and donors. But also, perhaps, it's an issue about priorities. And I'll talk about that a little more, maybe. Um, I think that one of the key messages that one has to take from the evidence about developing educational systems and capacity is imp improving teacher training. 
both initial training and continuing training. Now, I'm not suggesting that universities should reinvent themselves as teacher training colleges, but I think that universities contain expertise that can help raise the game generally, internationally, globally, raise the game of teacher education and teacher quality. Universities need to offer a range of opportunities to students at third level. They need to renew what they offer, come up with new ideas, new approaches. But I would also say that universities must not become the default destination for all young people who complete school or secondary school. It is vital for social and economic development that universities retain the values, standards and integrity of university education as we have understood it. A university degree must retain its meaning. Universities must strive to be key guarantors, key guarantors of the standards and relevance of their own work. Universities collectively, and they can support each institution in turn. Of course, they must also invite others to share in these responsibilities so that they're not elite and exclusive and cut off from the communities they serve. Uh, and they must also join with others in the cr critical task of promoting standards and relevance in the wider educational system. Now, to do most of this, universities are going to depend heavily on their faculty, their staff, academic staff, both to serve better their, the student population, but also to serve better the wider educational community. They can try to encourage greater intellectual inquiry and effort by their faculty, and I think they can do this by offering various, presumably non-monetary incentives. They can also recognize a wider range of research approaches, perhaps, and to value the deepening capacity in areas of evaluation and participatory research and action, action research, which I think are all very relevant to this issue of building capacity in the wider education system. Universities can help to generate an authoritative evidence base on, on the contexts in which young people live and on the issues which young people face. And they can also, as we have been seeing, help to highlight the experiences and capacities of young people. It is very important, again, to say that our overall understanding should be based on a strong evidence base an evidence base that includes the direct accounts and the direct experience of young people. Otherwise, we re risk relying on the suppositions of adults who are, in fact, mostly quite removed from the critical realities. I know I've been stressing this point, but I think it's, it's, it's very important. It is especially important to understand well the logic of young people as actors, how they assess and negotiate the various pressures they encounter, Researchers can play a valuable role in synthesizing evidence across a range of disciplines and perspectives. And as, of course, as we expect from researchers, to do this with great clarity and also remaining true to the idea of searching for the unexpected. Universities can help to strengthen research capacity in each country to build research skills for youth-centered and youth-involved research. They can harness the potential contribution of relevant disciplines, many relevant disciplines, psychology, education, social work, economics, business, and so on, individually and collectively. I sound like I'm profiling Optensia again. <laughs> Because, of course, Optensia is a very good example of the way in which I think universities need to move. And, of course, NWU has the uh, advantage of first mover in this, but I think we have to envisage a future where the university disciplines work much more interactively and creatively together and abandon their traditional silos. And I think Optensia offers us a very good exemplar of how that can be done. The other thing I think that's impressive about Optensia is that it's working at trying to deepen understanding at both a micro and macro, at both micro and macro levels. 
Universities can seek to ensure a sufficient focus on marginalized young people, on minorities. They can also, of course, recognize the emerging gender divide in education, where many boys and men seem to be alienated from formal education. Clearly, the, the immediate challenge has to be to, to ensure gender parity in educational opportunities for poorer young people. And that means both getting the missing girls into the education system, but it also means trying to hold on to the boys who are departing. And research can assist us in better understanding the practicalities of how to do both these things. Universities can support effective models of lifelong learning, especially for late entrance or late re-entrance to formal education. We must plan to provide opportunities for young people now who have missed out on opportunities now. We must plan to give them opportunities in the future, and we must plan to give the next generations of young people better opportunities than the current generations have had. Universities can, of course, help to pilot innovative models in collaboration with other universities and other actors. And they can also, of course, help to evaluate effectiveness. Universities are uniquely placed in terms of their potential for stimulating well-informed local action in their role as some kind of honest brokers between the different stakeholders and communities. But they can also promote national and international networking and cooperation. Universities can assist in sensitizing policymakers, professionals, and institutions to a more youth-centered perspective in planning and governance. They can do this in many ways, by the messages they give their graduates, they, by the messages they transmit in professional training and continuing professional development. And, of course, there are many other ways in which they can communicate their messages to the wider public. Universities need to collaborate with other key actors in promoting and aligning effective bottom-up as well as top-down responses to youth issues. These partners include government, government agencies, employers in the private and public sector, education providers, wider civil society, NGOs, trade unions, youth organizations, and local and international donors. Bottom-up approaches also rely on young people who are ready to participate in the relevant processes. Universities can work globally to cultivate youth leadership from the ground up, drawing not just from the young people from the elites, but from young people from underrepresented and underserved groups. They can help to pilot and evaluate beacon or exemplar projects that de de demonstrate how best to proceed in education and wider systems. Universities can work to increase their collective research capacity and, crucially, the resources for research devoted to this area of youth and poverty. They can seek to influence the funding priorities of research councils and donors. They can encourage and support international, international collaborations. Universities belong to a global network of peers, tapping into and learning from relevant experience abroad can help to produce more effective responses at different levels. These international links may help to release great added value in terms of additional financial support and intellectual synergies. The university sector can also promote networking related to youth issues with other universities and the research community in their respective countries. They can help use the capacity of social media and the internet to stimulate interest and share experience and best practice. Above all, they can share in the vital project of inspiring hope that we can secure change and development that, benefits, that benefit young people in poverty. In this lecture, I've been making the case for and mapping out a potential agenda, imagining a future where there is serious engagement globally with the needs of young people currently excluded. Young people locked out in their different societies across the world. It is a daunting challenge, but one that can and must be engaged with. Overall, the aim must be to promote 
an imaginative and comprehensive approach to one of the grand challenges of our times. Universities are key institutions in this project. They can be remote role models and capacity builders for the wider education system and for other key systems in society. This is not to suggest that universities should be deflected from their core mission of teaching and research. It will be for other institutions and organizations primarily to deliver change to young people outside university. But it will be for the universities to promote optimistic engagement with the challenge of youth who are locked out by poverty. Universities can support evidence building and capacity building that stimulate and assist the delivery of new and effective approaches to excluded youth. Youth and poverty is one of the grand challenges of our times. The UN system's upcoming sustainable development goals will, I think, make that challenge even more relevant. The, the urgency of building sustainable societies means that youth and poverty is emphatically a challenge whose time is now. I am also arguing that, that it is a challenge that universities must now embrace nationally and internationally. Thank you very much indeed. I know what you mean, said the old man. 
Um, yeah, you said you want to do research is relevant. And as a campus, we are proud to be associated with Optentia, and we can see the impact of the work you are doing. So, all that we want to say to you is continue with the good work you and the staff members are doing. For Gilligan, good luck with your future endeavors. We hope that this will be a fruitful collaboration with you and the Optentia Research Group, and that we will see you again on the campus. I would like now to hand a token. Um, to uh, illustrate your, your association with our campus. <laughs>